Hello, I am Frank Kane, and this is Frankly Speaking, the show where we drill deep into the insights of some of the world's leading policymakers. Today, I am joined by Shaukat Aziz, global financial expert from his time as a senior executive of Citigroup and former finance minister and prime minister of Pakistan. Mr. Aziz is going to share with us his thoughts on Saudi Arabia in transformation, as well as Islamabad's relationship with the kingdom and indeed with the rest of the world. Mr. Aziz, welcome to Frankly Speaking. Pleasure to be here, sir. It's a pleasure to have you. Let me ask for, immediately from the outset, in view of your huge uh, financial experience uh, and your knowledge of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, how well do you think the Kingdom has done in its COVID-19 response? Some people suggest that it hasn't done enough. Frankly speaking, they say it has the lowest uh, spend in terms of fiscal stimulus of any of the G20 countries. What do you think? I would say that when a pandemic like the one we faced happens, uh, you have to consider very carefully how you react to it. And I think Saudi Arabia's response was more than adequate, more than what was needed. And I think whenever the state intervenes, you have to, uh, there are many drivers of uh, that influence and change which occur. It is not just giving money to people. It is really creating an enabling environment to get your business back to where it should be. Now, the crisis created, of course, a, 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 a lower demand probably in certain products. It created less of investments because people were uncertain what would happen or what would not happen. But all these are part of a process. And when you evaluate the performance of the government in overall economic policy, really, I think, and I have, I'm biased in a sense that I have lived in that country and worked and run a major bank there, uh, Saudi American Bank, Samba, for many, many years. I would say that the quality of the technocrats in Sama and the Ministry of Finance were world class. And I'm not saying it because we are talking about it today. I have worked myself personally in 12 countries around the world and managed big regions for city. So I speak when I compare people, I compare them to that audience. And I would say that the technical and the business skills and the leadership skills of the people who are even today in the hierarchy of the central bank or the Ministry of Finance are world class at the top. I okay. don't know. Or I accept that. But, yeah. but I was thinking more in terms of <laughs> the strategic uh, response to the pandemic. Yes. Because the kingdom has uh, increased VAT, it, yeah. ha it has cut government spending. Yes. Aren't these counter to what people normally do in a financial and economic crisis? Yeah. Sh shouldn't we spend our way out of a crisis? Yeah. That is a very difficult question to answer. But for anybody, not just me. But let me tell you, sir, the whole purpose, when you look at uh, undertaking initiatives which would impact your budget, meaning extra expenditure, there are checks and balances there too, built in, whether you like it or not. If you go too much into deficit financing and try to pump in money, which may or may not get the results you think, then you are really get, going down a very steep slope. So the key is to stimulate the economy up to a point so that the economic uh, engine works and that gradually builds up the economy back to the new paradigm. Now, the fact is, with all these crises happening, some of them are, have pretty long-term implications. You have to reposition your economy. You have to do things smarter. You have, and believe me, change in many countries, developed or developing, I've worked in both. Unless the pain comes, people don't change. So, the leadership has to take dis um, uh, difficult trade-offs. And in, when I ran Pakistan's economy and the country, we used to face this issue every so often because there would be uh, groups of businessmen and special interests who wanted something done a certain way. But you can't do that. You have to make trade-offs. And I think in a situation like this, the trade-offs were made properly. Uh, 
naturally, in some situations, you may get better benefit or less, then you adjust. And reform, sir, is not a one-time effort. Structural reforms are a permanent need and requirement for any country and any government. It never ends. It's not a reform season. You do it once and then you sleep for a year. Economic management must assume that we are dealing with a continuous paradigm, a changing paradigm. Uh, if you only look in the rearview mirror and drive that car, you'll be in trouble. Oh, I understand, yeah. So you have to be nimble, as I said earlier. You have to be able to move quickly, react quickly to changing the, what is a good finance minister or a good finance minister is anticipating, is adjusting, knows which buttons to press when something happens. Don't do it too quickly. Make sure you do your homework. And I will tell you one last thing about the financial team in Saudi Arabia, because I've worked with them. And I've uh, run large parts of cities, geographic business around the world. I, when people used to ask me, when I went from South Africa, uh, Saudi Arabia to, I was head of Asia Pacific, so right. all those countries. They said, how was Saudi Arabia? I said, believe me, the quality of the bureaucrats and the people in the central bank exceed what you have. And they said, come on. Then I had to explain everything. And then now, you know, people uh, are beginning to recognize that. Moving away from finance yeah. and economy, uh, the, the other great area of transformation in the kingdom has been the social, uh, religious and cultural yes. reforms that have taken place. Absolutely. And you said uh, uh, we can't go too, too quickly, but do you think the kingdom has pushed these things through in, in, in a too fast a pace? Does that risk provoking some kind of backlash? Yeah. No, that is, um, when I say that is, I said, um, uh, I will repeat again. Any reform you do, you have to measure the reaction and impact for various sectors of your society. That's a judgment call. When I was in Pakistan, I reformed, I, my reform was in three words, I can tell you. Liberalize, deregulate, privatize. And we went on these three en masse. There were riots, the unions went on strike, you know, all those things happened in my time, in my country. But if you do it right, it works out. And it all right. worked out. <clears throat> With the result, your GDP grows and your growth rate grows. So in right. Saudi Arabia, I think the best thing which has happened, if you ask me, in the last few years, uh, His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, and the, His Majesty and all the other leadership of the country, they have done reforms which you could never even consider or think about. If, when I lived there, I couldn't have expected that they would do that. I think today in structural reform agenda, I would put Saudi Arabia in the top few countries of the world. There is a dark side to this uh, process, isn't yes. there? And you were a, uh, you, you had first-hand experience uh, of violent extremism in Pakistan uh, yes. in, in 2004. I I yes. um, and it seems to me that Pakistan has still not uh, overcome this challenge Saudi Arabia seems to have controlled that violent yeah. extremist urge. How has Saudi been successful and Pakistan has yes. not? Yes. Uh, obviously, the security apparatus of Saudi Arabia, and I've lived in Saudi, so I can tell you, is superb. They're very good. And, uh, on the other hand, their population is also much lower than Pakistan. is a huge mass of people. Mm -hmm. So the, the physical machinery of the law enforcement and intelligence, they are excellent also, but they just don't have the, all the resources which are required to handle a country of uh, the size Pakistan is. Having said that, I think uh, all these, Pakistan too, if you go out, security is much better, crime is, uh, you know, street crime, all that stuff, way down, women drive, there's total freedom to men and women to uh, drive, do anything they want, go to the marketplaces. They're all full of people. So it is not reaching, you know, you have to see in any situation for a country, there are many degrees of uh, sort of uh, performance in a certain area. If it is not hurting the overall functioning of the state, you need not panic prematurely. And this is the mistake sometimes some countries have made. 
So if you know the pulse of your country, which in Saudi Arabia, the leadership is very... They certainly do, aren't they? Yeah, yes. they are excellent at that, I would say, having lived there. Uh, and we tried, I tried to follow a lot of this stuff when I was uh, running uh, the government in Pakistan, because we picked up all these... Uh, and there's a lot of wisdom in their thinking. Okay, what did you pick up from <laughs> Saudi that you applied in well, Pakistan? Yeah. I picked up a lot of things. First of all, invest in your key people. Now, if you go to Sama or the Ministry of Finance, that was my initial dealing. I'm biased a little bit towards that because I was a banker. You were a banker, so, yeah. uh, No, for us, everything started and ended in Sama or the Ministry of Finance. I tell you, and I have lived in 10 countries and managed for Citibank, uh, one of the largest banks in the world, large chunks of their business. I would tell you that the finance professionals I interacted, and I can, you know, I say that without any hesitation, were world class. And they still are, but mm -hmm. in my time, I actually dealt with them. And so people would ask me, hey, Mr. Aziz, how do you feel? Can you talk to them about what you talked and I worked at all over the world? I said, I'm, they are much better in many cases than some, many of the people in other places. So we should never have this feeling or complex that we are, uh, that say Saudi Arabia has people who are not at par. I think, frankly, the central bank staff in, for example, which I dealt with because I was a banker there, was as good, if not better, than most of the countries I worked in. Let me ask you one specific question about the banking industry yes, sir. in Saudi Arabia, uh, because we are seeing a wave of mergers and consolidation, aren't Absolutely. we? NCB, Samba, al yes. um, uh, with Saab. Yeah. Is, is this a good thing, uh, yeah. or, or are we just creating more monopolistic, yeah. anti-competitive structures? Is this good for, yeah. for uh, uh, customers? As you may know, I was the CEO of Samba for many years before, in my younger days. So I have an emotional attachment to Samba. Mm -hmm. But having said that, consolidation of the financial sector is the way to go. And it's sim simple economics. How is it simple economics? Because uh, with automation coming and with the, all the technology you have, you can create your, the bank, a much bigger bank, at, with much less people and much less expenditure. So economies of scale, basically it's economies of scale staring you in the face. If you, they take the merger of Samba. I'm a, I used to be CEO of Samba. I was the yes. managing director. So I felt a bit uh, very, very emotional when I heard, oh, Samba has been taken over. But this was the right thing to do because you're consolidating. Now, don't, they will... Don't customers have less choice, you know, and therefore... No, but uh, consolidation doesn't mean there won't be competition. In fact, all the competitors left on the scene because they are all uh, joining others or buying others, there's consolidation taking place. By the way, in the whole world, not just there, but we are talking about Saudi Arabia. That will make those banks much stronger. So they'll bring better products. They'll have larger balance sheets. They can finance bigger deals. They have more absorptive capacity for any shocks. Any economy can go through shocks in the world. The world goes through it all the time. So then their shock absorbers become much stronger too. So okay. it is... It so is a strong banking system yes, is a sir. shock absorber for yeah. economic crisis. Absolutely. And uh, uh, once you have that, then your view of risk, your view of how much appetite you have for certain types of risk changes. Uh, let, let me broaden the uh, discussion out, if you would, uh, and ask you about some uh, geopolitical issues. Certainly. Because we live in a troubled region, don't we? Uh, and uh, we have neighbours who are troublesome, uh, both Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, uh, in the form of Iran. Tell me, how do you think the world should approach uh, Iran? Yeah, Iran, uh, Iran also is a country with a lot of history, a lot of uh, smart people there but it is run by the clergy, effectively. And having said that, they do have professionals in the respective areas, but that, so the, the overall approach is very much influenced by the clergy. That, having said that, in my trips to Iran, 
I met the supreme leader and all the various hierarchy of the, when I was prime minister of my country, because they are neighbors of ours. So it was, uh, uh, when I went, I met all of them. I did not find them living in the past. Not? No. In terms of, now, uh, let me qualify that, in terms of reform. And in fact, in the discussion with people at that level, I said, so, yeah, re structural reforms is now a way of life. By doing structural reforms, any country is not doing something which is irrational. In fact, if you don't do it, you'll be left so far behind that even your rear view mirror will not be able to see you. Okay. Uh, is there a commonality of interest between Pakistan and Saudi Arabia in how they deal with, with the Iranian problem, if I can call it that? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, the, in Pakistan, Though, the, the, in terms of foreign policy, the sectarian element of the uh, uh, foreign policy is not very pronounced. So uh, we have a long border with Iran, and uh, as you know, mm. you know. So uh, our uh, strategic uh, strategy with them is to maintain a relationship which is peaceful and avoid any tensions. Naturally, we have our own sovereignty to protect. That just goes without saying. And we also have friends in the world, like Saudi Arabia, who are considered really very strategic partners for Pakistan. Was that the it reason? It keeps changing once in a while, yeah. but. Was that the reason that Pakistan uh, decided not to come to Saudi Arabia's support in Yemen, do you think? The desire to maintain uh, peaceful relations with Iran? I'm not sure that would be the reason, yeah. Because uh, if the uh, if uh, Saudi Arabia had a certain view, uh, I'm not actually clear what our uh, sort of uh, on, what our approach was on that issue. So I don't want to you know no, just no. guess and tell you something from the air. But my own view is that the Saudi relationship with Pakistan. And I'm talking, you know, leaders come, they go, but I'm talking about the core essence of the country, which includes the military, which includes many other uh, centers of power, etc. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a very, very, very critical part of our relationships and foreign policy. On Iran, we share a huge border. There are very few issues with them in terms... Uh, are, really, if you say, what disputes do you have with Iran? We don't have many. We don't have with Saudi Arabia either. So if we can, we have that huge border. If we can keep them quiet and keep good relations, it doesn't mean you have to be hostile to them. Right. Then it's, a, it's a, a good diplomacy. With Saudi Arabia, it's different. Saudi Arabia is... Uh, when I looked at Saudi Arabia, as a relationship, it was like looking at your elder brother. You know, they care for each you other. Learning. And sometimes, if we did something which we shouldn't have done, they'll say, hey, what did you do? And if we had something to say that, look, we did it this way, that way, and mutually sharing, we also exchange troops. I we see. post some people there too. Uh, Let me ask needed. you one briefly, if you yes. don't mind, because uh, sure. uh, it comes in this kind of area. Uh, do you think Pakistan might follow the example of countries in this part of the world and normalize relations with Israel? Yeah, uh, uh, personally, I think the, uh, a lot of work will have to be done uh, on the domestic scene to, to make that acceptable. To make that exception. To, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you mean in terms of internal Pakistan yes, consumption? Yes, yes. The domestic politics could be, would have to be considered. Now, uh, having said that, the, uh, I'm sure privately every country keeps in touch with everybody. I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't uh, get involved in that type of, that part of the uh, business, but I can tell you that having relations with a country is now not necessarily something which should really be as big an issue as it has been made by all of us over the years. It doesn't mean that if you, if I know you, I agree with everything you say and do. 
and vice versa. So I think the door should be opened. However, you have to carry your domestic population and other things with you. Having said that, you know, if you open the Quran, Moses is a prophet for everybody. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what are we trying to do? Now, historically, because of Palestine and the issues surrounding the whole situation, we developed a mindset which was uh, based on that particular issue. Now, that issue is, I assume it's making, I, I know it's making some progress, but uh, all this will help in the end, I think, uh, open the doors and you will have a peaceful, more prosperous world. At the end of the day, that's your objective. Now, I don't expect any country to violate their core values. And so don't misunderstand, please, my comments. Okay. Core values are never negotiable. But having said that, if relations can be done without upsetting the core, then we see how things so go. Do you think normalization might upset May, core values within Pakistan? It could in certain elements. So, you know, it was all about leadership. The leadership has to manage that. Uh, it won't be, it's not a slam dunk, if you know, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You know the term. Yeah. So I would say that one should uh, take a good, make a good temperature check and have, if you're doing something like that, you have to have good sound reasons and you have to, con you have to this is leadership. If you believe, if you believe mm. that this is the way to go, then you create the grounds for taking such a decision. Mr. Aziz, I'm going to throw some of your own words back at you uh, so, in, in my final question to you. Please. Uh, because you've been a global financial warrior, you once wrote. <laughs> I don't know. And maybe. you've also grasped the thorny rose of politics, haven't you? I don't, uh, well, I'm trying. Which, uh, well, uh, which was the most challenging uh, 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 was one question. And uh, what's the next job? Have, is there another big job in you? Quite frankly, are you going to retire to West London now? Or do you see something else? No, you see, I don't look at my next moves as a job. It's very important to keep that in mind, in the sense that God has been kind to me. I've worked very hard. I stayed in one company for 30 years called Citigroup. This is Citibank, Citibank. Yeah. The largest financial house in the world, whatever. Uh, largest or not doesn't make a difference, but it is one of the largest in terms of network, over 100 countries, et cetera, et cetera. So what they produce is globalists like us. So I could go to Brazil, I could go to uh, Nairobi, I could go to uh, London, I could go to Riyadh. I worked in a lot of these places. So. so you create a mindset. The seeds are sown for not looking at each other through your passports, but through who you are. Right, okay. Now that's a big distinct distinction in many people. Superficially, they say, oh, he's from say, Pakistan, he's from India, she's from Israel, she is from Timbuktu, wherever. So our mindset, uh, because I worked for Citigroup for 30 years, as a Pakistani, I still carry a Pakistani passport. So the Pak, uh, which created, you know, challenges, etc. But the point is, you have to use stick by your principles and not because you are from country A or B, you'll think differently. You will do what is logical in your mind and then do it. You don't look at your passport every day and say, what does this tell me? I think, to me, nationality is less important. It's your inner self, which has to believe in certain things. I have enough to keep busy though. Right. And my, uh, sphere of activity includes the United States, China, the Middle East. You are a globalist, aren't and you? And Europe. So that's yeah. the... Okay. Mr. Aziz, I must thank you indeed for joining me on Frankly Speaking tonight. Very grateful to have you here and a fascinating conversation. Thank, thank you, you very much indeed. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you.
Thank you.